welcome everyone. I am Margot Crawford and I am a professor of English and the director of the Center for Africana Studies. And I am so happy to be able to introduce Mia Bay and her latest book. Let me explain that this event, it is co-hosted by the Center for Africana Studies and the Department of Africana Studies, and it's co-sponsored by the Department of History. And we are indeed here to hear Mia Bay discuss this book. I have it in my head. I cannot wait to read it. And we also are going to have a book signing after today's talk. So please do stay for the book signing. Mia Bay is the Roy F. and Jeanette P. Nichols Professor of American History here at University of Pennsylvania. Bay is a leading scholar of African American history. An organization of American historians distinguished lecturer Bay is a member of the executive board of the Society of American Historians and serves on the editorial boards of Reviews in American History, the Journal of African American History, and the African American Intellectual History Society's Black Perspectives blog. Traveling Black, the story of race and resistance published by Harvard University Press is the latest book in Bay's stunning body of work. Her earlier books, many of us know these earlier books, but I will still name them. The White Image and the Black Mind, African-American Ideas About White People, 1830 to 1925, and that was published in 2000. To Tell the Truth Freely, The Life of Ida B. Wells, published in 2009, and the edited work, Ida B. Wells, The Light of Truth, The Writings of an Anti-Lynching Crusader, uh, published in 2014. Mia Bay is also the co-author of Freedom on My Mind, A History of African Americans with Documents, and the co-editor of two collections of essays, Towards an Intellectual History of Black Women, published in 2015, and Race and Retail, Consumption Across the Color Line, published in 2015. Bay is the 2020 Patrick Henry Writing Fellow at Washington College's Star Center, where she is now completing a new book about African-American ideas about Thomas Jefferson. Without any more delay, let me welcome, she's already here, as we know, here at the University <laughs> of Pennsylvania, but I'm welcoming, welcoming her to this room so we can celebrate this book. Thank you, Lydia. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Crawford. It's great to be back for an in-person event at the University of Pennsylvania, and especially at Africana Studies, which is one of my favorite departments. No offense to history. <laughs> so what I'm going to do today is read a book, from, a bit from the book, and try to give you an overview. It's kind of, kind of a big, sprawling book, so we'll see how well that goes, but let me just give you a sense of what's going on. Um, this book is a book about the experiences of African American travelers, and it sort, of, it sort of takes shape around the experiences of different travelers, so I'll start with one of them. I remember distinctly the first time it dawned upon me with irresistible crushing force that there was something radically painfully wrong with the color of my face, wrote Mary Church Terrell, a prominent leader of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, in an unpublished essay written sometimes in the first few years of the 20th century. Her revelation dated back to the years immediately following the Civil War when she was not more than five years old. And it took shape around an encounter she had while traveling on the train with her father, the wealthy Memphis businessman Robert Church. Molly Church, as she was then known, was seated by herself in what she remembered as the best car on the train, her father having stepped into an adjacent smoking car to speak to an acquaintance. As she waited for him to return, she was suddenly confronted by a conductor who challenged her presence in the car. Although Tennessee would not yet pass laws mandating racial segregation on trains until the early 1880s, African Americans were not always welcome in the comfortable passenger coaches where Robert Church had seated his daughter. Known as ladies' cars, these were first class, non smoking coaches designed to accommodate women and their traveling companions. Their occupants were typically white women, and so 
the five-year-old Terrell struck the conductor as being out of place. Whose little N-word is this, he asked the other passengers in the car after unsuccessfully demanding answers from the frightened little girl who recalled that he wanted to know who I was and what I was doing in that car instead of sitting in the smoker where I belong. Terrell was rescued by the return of her father, a hot-tempered man who threatened to shoot the conductor if he did not let her, his daughter retain her seat. But she had been nonetheless introduced to the race problem by way of a confrontation that she experienced as an assault on both her gender and her race. Unsure what she had done to merit the conductor's disapproval, Terrell later asked her mother about the incident. I asked her why the conductor had wanted to take me out of the nice clean coach and put me in one that my father said was dirty. I assured her I'd been careful of everything she told me to do. For instance, my hands were clean and so was my face. I had not mussed my hair. I was brushed back and perfectly smooth. Um, I hadn't soiled my dress even a little bit. I was sitting up straight and proper. Terrell's story records a particular moment in the South journey to Jim Crow, reminding us that the path from slavery to segregation was not seamless, especially on the South railroads. Jim Crow cars and segregated transportation first took shape in the antebellum North, where many of the nation's earliest common carriers, that is transportation systems, um, like steamships and carriages, um, adopted it, um, and it came later in the South where whites displayed little interest in segregated social spaces so long as most blacks were slaves. But all of this would begin to change um, towards the late 19th century and basically starting after the Civil War when Terrell has her experience. Um, and it would never become entirely uniform, um, but with the emancipation of three million slaves in the South after the Civil War, um, the regulation and segregation of black mobility became a persistent preoccupation among Southerners. So let's start just by thinking about the Jim Crow car, which is one of the developments of that time period. What Terrell experienced was kind of an early Jim Crow rule where she was being put into something wh which was then called the smoking car, which was a second class car, which eventually became the Jim Crow car. Over time, the railroads would abandon amenities such as ladies' cars and first class cars in favor of colored cars and whites only cars, or what you see on top here, which are these combination cars, which often had a Jim Crow section um, alongside a white section with maybe a luggage compartment in between. The white section in the Jim Crow car was often the smoking section um, or the section where railroad workers did their business. So it was never ideal. And that's one of the key things to think about when it comes to thinking about the Jim Crow car and subsequent forms of uh, transportation and segregated transportation in particular is that Separate but equal, as the law would come to term these the kind of accommodations, was never equal. It was always unequal. And this is sort of most obvious in this picture from 1937 below, where you see the white car on one side and the Jim Crow car on the other. It's plain even in the photograph that the seats are different. Um, it is also true that in the white car there was air conditioning. Um, and. Uh, some other amenities, and this was fairly typical of Jim Crow transportation. This is the direction things were going when Mary Church Terrell was traveling. Um, it would take a while to fully develop, and the case law, the case that would um, sort of give uh, Jim Crow cars the sort of sanction of the Supreme Court would be Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, which is a case a lot of us know better from education than transportation, but was nonetheless a railroad case um, and something that people were up against as they rode in the Jim Crow car. Plessy was also a railroad case that actually, under the terms of the Supreme Court decision, applied only to transportation within Louisiana or within a state. The court noted that um, interstate commerce was actually not the province of the Supreme Court under the Constitution. It had to be regulated. Um, 
by the states working in tandem or, and by what would become the Interstate Commerce Commission. So African Americans would always fight this, but largely success, unsuccessfully in the early years. And you would develop this Jim Crow system of transportation in trains that in many ways would become a metaphor for the kinds of generalized discrimination African Americans experience, both because it was so generalized and familiar to everyone, and, both because it, and also because it was so kind of humiliating, inconvenient, sometimes dangerous. Um, and I, this image here is just a kind of example of the Jim Crow waiting rooms that began to spring up after Plessy. Um, Jim Crow railroad stations would all have a certain kind of organization. Often blacks entered from a different side. They had different waiting rooms. The waiting rooms were often smaller. And the only point of connection in these facilities was usually the ticket office. The ticket office served both blacks and whites, but according to Southern custom, it served whites first, which meant that if you got to the train station, if you didn't get to the train station in time, you might actually be just waiting and watching them serve white people and not being able to take a train. Um, so it was these kind of little details that were both humiliating and genuinely inconvenient. During the wartime, people would actually sometimes wait for days to get on a train or bus because of this system. Um, so for all these and some other reasons, which I'm happy to talk about more in the question period, uh, Jim Crow travel became something that African Americans in general detested, lobbied against, um, went to the courts and also went to the railroads, Congress, all trying to overturn it largely unsuccessfully uh, for much of the early 20th century. Um, but there's also, they also began to look for alternatives to Jim Crow transportation. Uh, one of the great sort of um, socio-historical developments of the 20th century is really the development of all sorts of forms of new transportation, which many Americans greeted very eagerly, and perhaps none more so than African Americans who were always looking for some kind of alternative to Jim Crow. So that brings me to the story of another traveler, um, the famous Jack Johnson, who loved to drive. Uh, he was a big black man who carried himself with swaggering self-confidence. And in 1908, he appalled much of the white world by becoming the first man of color to win the heavyweight championship of the world. His mastery of boxing sweet science was a challenge to ma white masculinity, as was his penchant for consorting with white women. So was his love of cars. Far too proud and hot-headed to be comfortable traveling Jim Crow, Johnson began buying automobiles as soon as they became avail available. By 1909, he owned five cars, which he drove everywhere. His command of cars, as cultural critic Paul Gilroy notes, through hostility, harassment, and an interjected covetous admiration from the police wherever he went. Johnson received tickets for speeding, reckless driving, obstructing traffic, and other moving violations whenever he drove, which discouraged him not at all. Um, he parked his cars on the sidewalks in Chicago and once told a judge that his constant speeding was simply done for advertising purposes. He also toyed with the idea of a career in car racing and offered $5,000 to any driver who, was, who would beat him in a race. Johnson's offer was clearly decided to, des designed to muscle his way into a new field. Membership in the Motorsports Division of the American Automobile Association, AAA, which back then had a racing side, um, was limited to whites, and the AAA's contest board refused to license him or sanction any race in which he participated. Johnson's efforts almost failed. AAA drivers were all but unanimous in decrying Johnson as too ignorant of the mechanical end of an automobile to be a worthy opponent. However, in 1910, world champion racer Barney Oldfield defied the AAA's contest bans to beat Johnson in a race and found himself banned from the circuit for over the year as a result. Triple A racing would remain an all-white sport for many years to come. Still, Johnson didn't need to win races um, or even drive particularly quickly to attract attention as a driver. 
one of the few black men of his era to own even one car. Johnson was once arrested for cruising slowly down Broadway Street in New York City. Um, and the charge was that he was driving a car with Chicago plates. Disgusted to be stopped yet again, he said, I goes fast, they arrest me, and now it seems like if I go slow, they does the same. Next thing, someone will arrest me for being a brunette in a blonde town. As Johnson was clearly aware, his race was responsible for much of the outrage and anxiety his driving inspired. Uh, both the police who harassed him and the AAA drivers who refused to race with him drew on a variety of racial stereotypes when they questioned his ability to own and operate a car. At the start of the 20th century, car ownership was still largely limited to wealthy whites, and Johnson's multiple car purchases disrupted established hierarchies of class and color. His mere act of driving was also equally problematic. Um, often barred from skilled jobs during that time period, blacks were also widely held to lack mechanical aptitude. But Johnson drove with ease and even took on white champions. As Johnson's experience suggests, the technological transformations of the automotive age offered African-American travelers both new forms of mobility and new sites of racial contestation. Cars were a symbol of freedom and mobility for all Americans. It was a time when many whites waxed eloquent about the freedom to sort of drive the open road. Um, and it was something that African Americans were equally drawn to in their hopes of escaping Jim Crow. Um, but traveling by car would not bring them the freedom that they hoped. African Americans thought as private spaces, cars would give them autonomy. But traveling by cars is not actually private. Driving any distance requires entering what sociologist John Urey calls a system of automobility, um, which is to say using the many things that make a car useful, from roads uh, to places where you maintain your car to hotels, roadside service areas, uh, um, and sort of uh, going to all these places that we sort of drive to get to what, what cars are designed for. And cars also have a kind of symbolic meaning that Jack Johnson confronted. Um, they are, for many people, their most valuable, valuable piece of property other than perhaps a home. Um, and what kind of car people own is something that people pass judgment on. Cars also expose people to the criminal justice system. All these things were the kinds of things that black drivers were up against. Um, and perhaps the most difficult one that would challenge black car owners was just the sort of simple, simple process of navigating by car, finding roadside accommodations, places to eat, places to get gas. Um, None of this discouraged African Americans from buying cars. One of the points that the book emphasizes is that black car buying began very early. A lot of African Americans bought used cars. They would do things like spend the, their cotton picking money after a very good crop on cars. Uh, they sought the freedom that cars would bring. Um, but they would often have trouble fully attaining that freedom. And this would, go, this would also be true of buses which begin to, begin to be widely used around the 1930s, not, not long after cars. Both of these transportation systems really relied on the development of good roads. Um, and buses were more affordable than cars, but also problematic for African Americans. Both but buses were not always open to African Americans. And in both cars and buses, Blacks would have trouble securing things to eat on the road. They would have trouble securing accommodations. So early bus lines would sometimes refuse black customers altogether. Um, and one of the reasons that they did this um, was just an issue of accommodations. Um, facilities such as service stations in the South and sometimes even in the Midwest were reluctant to serve black customers. Sometimes it was a matter of not wanting to serve them beverages, food. Sometimes they were also unwilling to serve them um, gas. Um, and this had to do with the character of bus stations as a, as a kind of business. I'm sorry, bus stations, ga gas stations as a business. 
Gas stations replaced hardware stores, which originally supplied people with gas. And they were meant to be directed towards the sort of white woman consumer who didn't want to go to the hardware store to get gas. They were meant to make dry, traveling by car feel very domestic and comfortable. And I show this illustration because while well, I had never thought of it previously, uh, gas stations do all look like cottages. And people who advertise them would say things like, dress your, dress your station up with flowers. Like, and they, they also emphasize things like how clean the gas station was. Texaco actually had a white patrol that would drive around to make sure the bathrooms were clean. Um, but this also meant that they were middle class white spaces or aspired to be. And for this reason, they did not always welcome black customers. So African American drivers really had to struggle to, um, to to navigate the road and find places where they could pl stay, places where they could stop. And this led to some things that should perhaps are now once again familiar to us, such as the Negro Traveler's Green Book, um, various books and lists of places you could stay. Um, the Green Book was made famous recently by a movie of the same title and some other mentions, but um, I would emphasize that it wasn't the only one. It was a long tradition of black travel guides that goes back to the 1930s when there was one called Hackley and Harrison. And there was also a tradition among black musicians of simply exchanging such information because many black musicians toured pretty regularly. Um, so these were things that people would use to try to locate places. Um, some, some scholars have written about them, have sort of presented them as the answer to um, the problems that black travelers face. But one of the things I found in researching my book is that they were often a kind of incomplete and unsatisfying answer. They were often a little out of date. Um, you know, people describe things like going to a hotel and, that was recommended in the Green Book and finding out it was a whorehouse. Probably wasn't always a whorehouse, but you would have liked to know. Um, and and just uh, you know, just having difficulty using them. I mean, if Yelp reviews are unreliable today, these these booklets that were published not so frequently were even more problematic. Nonetheless, um, they were in wide circulation and demonstrated the ways in which um, the kinds of problems that African Americans experienced on the road were really were really serious. And beyond the Green Book. What people traditionally did was, like, if you knew anyone at all who had been where you were traveling, you would, you would ask them about their experience. If you knew anyone who lived there, you would probably try to stay with them. This was sort of the normal travel routine. In an era when, when white travelers were really being encouraged to and kind of enjoying the freedoms of the open road of just kind of driving until you see a hotel. So it was a very distinctive black travel history. And it was one that, um, African Americans found uncomfortable, resented, um, and sort of made them worry about whether they'd get to their destination on time and safely. So this meant that um, even with cars offering somewhat better transportation than, let's say, the Jim Crow car or the buses, which African Americans particularly detested as a very uncomfortable form of Jim Crow, African Americans were sort of eager to try new forms of transportation, including flight. Um, and I showed this picture of uh, this cartoon from Puck Magazine early to show this sort of notion that even before airplanes become something that people travel widely in, there is sort of a sort of new set of questions about whether they'll be segregated. Um, and there's also a kind of I ideas about whether this kind of modern, super high-tech technology is something that African Americans have any place on. Um, some aviation experts really said no. They said, one of them said, Negroes can't fly. They said it wasn't the kind of thing that black people would do. But of course, African Americans would seek airline accommodations. They would try to fly. And they would, once again, hope that in flying, they would have found some sort of freer and easier way to travel. But once again, this would not be the case. Airplanes would prove difficult to segregate, um, and they, in some ways, wouldn't entirely require a broad-scale segregation effort in, in this, insofar as the fact that, insofar as air, airplanes were too expensive for many black people during this, during the first half of the 20th century. Um, but those 
African Americans who could afford plane tickets during these years often had difficulty securing free access to planes. In the earliest years of tra traveling, African Americans were sometimes refused admission to planes altogether. Um, there were some court cases about whether airlines were in fact common care, airplanes were in fact common carriers. And eventually they did start to admit all black travelers. Um, but even when that happened, um, hopeful black predictions about um, airplanes squeezing out Jim Crow as a transportation system did not come, come true. Um, many people still saw this technology as largely the preserve, preserve of whites. And a variety of kind of segregated seating systems began to evolve um, during the years of the pro propeller plane, which had the prop propeller plane, which had, the, had a propeller in the front and a very uncomfortable front seat. African-American travelers often were put in that seat. Um, in the 1940s, as planes got bigger, they were often put in the same row together. And even when African-American travelers were admitted, they were always first in a line for any kind of travel disruption. So here was a case in which Ella Fitzgerald was bumped off a plane in Honolulu with several of her fellow, fellow musicians. Um, it was a, a stopover to refuel, and they left their purses and their sweaters and things on the plane, and they were not allowed to get back on because some white travelers had decided that they wanted to move on to Australia, where Fitzgerald was scheduled to sing. And uh, they had to spend several days in Honolulu, which doesn't sound like a terrible thing right now, but um, it meant that she did miss her concert, and she sued and won. Um, and these kind of things were some, the kind of thing that black airline travelers um, routinely encountered. And they also encountered significant segregation on the ground, which is sort of a forgotten history. Um, many airports were not built until the late 40s and 50s, but many of them in the South um, did institute various forms of segregation. Um, they were a little inconsistent. There's a colored waiting room sign on the far side of this uh, picture. Um, and these began to spread in the 1950s, even if, as African Americans were successfully um, winning cases in court that were saying that um, transportation segregation on trains and buses was in fact illegal. So all of this would be an ongoing fight right through to the civil rights movement, um, when in 1961, during the era of the more famous Freedom Rides, a group of ministers who flew to join the Freedom Riders were arrested uh, when they tried to eat at a segregated diner in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, and the, they would eventually be released. By 1961, you began to have federal authorities beginning to turn against travel segregation. And you began to have African Americans um, beginning to reap the fruits of a really long battle to desegregate transportation. Uh, this is one of the points of emphasis in the book that um, traveling black is a story of racism, but it's also a story of resistance in which you have African-American travelers going to the courts, going to the government, um, going to businesses, um, trying to overturn the system of segregated transportation. In the end, it would take all of these strategies plus nonviolent civil disobedience, such as we saw in the Freedom Rides of 1961, before the government would finally act decisively to end segregated transportation. Um, and then you would have a revol revolutionary moment in the early 60s um, with federal orders um, barring segregation on trains and buses and in in trains and in, in, in waiting rooms of all kinds and with the Kennedy administration getting rid of segregation in airports. And then finally in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you have the government taking action against segregation in roadside accommodations, hotels, um, restaurants, and the like. But and this is, this is a, a, a tremendous civil rights victory and something that was very hard fought and its importance shouldn't be underestimated. I think we can sometimes forget about it today because we 
because we don't see it anymore and, and because a lot of people, if they didn't personally experience it, are beginning to lose a sense of this as something that shaped people's experience. But it did, um, and it's, it's something that we should, we should remember. And then, but then in thinking about it, we also, I think, need to think about modern day forms of discrimination and segregation that people encounter when traveling. Um, by, the an by the time I got to the end of this book, I really hoped to sort of end on a high note. Um, but <laughs> we are in troubled times, and um, I felt like I could not end without thinking about the ways in which segregation, discrimination persists. Um, and you guys can prob probably think about travel issues that people experience today as well. Um, I would just highlight a couple as I close. Um, one is that, um, is that ironically the civil rights movement's successful desegregation of buses and trains came at a time when all, when all forms of travel by bus and rail were declining. By the 1960s, the United States had become a republic of drivers um, and um, people in which people move in and out of the suburbs. There had been a kind of triumph of car culture that had re reshaped not only local transportation, but long distance transportation as well. And the rise of the automobile decimated passenger service on railroads, forcing dozens of lines out of business. Today, only com the, only commercial, only, the only commercial railroads lines still in business carry freight. Um, and passenger rail sur survives only in the form of Amtrak, um, which has a very small number of lines, about 30 now, um, only 184 when it started. And all of this contrasts with the fact that there used to be hundreds of train routes across the country. The same can be said for buses, which have greatly declined in number since World War II. And all of this is very problematic because blacks and Latinos have significantly lower levels of car ownership and ca even car access than other Americans, um, which means that they can be uh, isolated in place, especially in terms of crisis. Um, many years ago, as I was just starting out on this book, Hurricane Katrina brought that vividly to people's attention. Uh, the city of New Orleans actually had no plan to get people who did not own cars out of New Orleans. And as a result, Many thousands of people were stranded. A lot of us saw pictures of people in the Superdome. You had these, you know, people trying to use boats. Um, and you know, this is something that happened back then and could easily happen again. We are still a car-centric society. Um, and there's all kinds of attendant inequalities that go with that. Um, our state and state governments, federal governments, municipal governments tend to put far more money into facilitating um, transportation by car. They put more money into roads and highways than any form of public transportation. Um, so poor people who pay taxes, the same taxes as everyone else, in, in effect don't contribute to forms of transportation they can actually use. Um, and black and Latino drivers tend to experience discrimination at almost every level of car ownership. Insurance costs more. Um, Credit is less readily available. You pay a higher rate. Um, virtually everything. So all of the, these are kind of ongoing forms of discrimination. And then in recent years, I think we've also seen, it's also been sort of vividly illustrated just what a problem racial profiling on the road is, is becoming. Um, African Americans have always been un subject to scrutiny in driving cars. You see that with Jack Johnson, but it actually got much worse starting in the 80s with Ronald Reagan's war on drugs, uh, which um, was a moment in which police policies that explicitly targeted black uh, and Latino drivers were developed, and you began to develop this kind of just stopping people to look and see what they're having their car traffic stops. Um, which are still ongoing today um, and have resulted in, you know, not just um, people being stopped, but obviously forms of violence um, and continue to make traveling black quite dangerous for many African Americans. So, all, so this is sort of where we are today. And they, it all underscores the ways in which
transportation is really a major site for uh, struggles over equality as well as a major strike for um, major site for racism and something we need to kind of keep on thinking about in the modern world. Thank you. Oh, segregated transportation in the medical field? Did, okay, sorry, I didn't quite get that. Um, I I'm not familiar with that, but it, it, it was a big issue. In fact, one of the dangers of traveling by car was the fact was if you were in an accident, um, you might not be picked up by ambulances serving white hospitals. Um, and there were a number of stories, some of them apocryphal and many of them real, of people who, who never reached the hospital or reached it much too late to actually be treated because in the South there are these different hospitals that people were taken to. <laughs> I just wondered um, to what extent you find your book um, focus on contemporary technologies as a space that's employed to continue these practices and thinking about the way in which, for instance, with the TSA, mm -hmm. especially around, you know, obviously, um, air travel, that it becomes a way in which two ingredients of discrimination sort of separated out and it's, it's now. Um, Framed as the, the machine mm -hmm. it is the is, is actually um, identifying those who are suspect. Mm -hmm. and so I just wondered to what degree you. Yeah, that's a good question. It is something I do look into to some degree in the epilogue and, and into my in my very kind of depressing epilogue. And it it is. It is everywhere. I mean, there are, there are studies showing that the TSA is especially aggressive with certain populations, um, black women, for instance. Um, and um, there's even studies showing that the scanners and stuff do not understand. They understand some bodies and some hairstyles be better than others, so that all of this kind of results in a sort of automatic level of discrimination and nuisance for black travelers. And then there's also emerging literature um, on experiences of discrimination with things like Uber, Airbnb, all the, the sharing economy is an economy that in which people kind of decide who they want to share with, and that's, that's a problem um, and will continue to be one. Be one. And then beyond that, there's also um, some of the problem is sometimes incorporated into the kind of algorithms and technology that is being used in the various kind of software that people use to facilitate things like sharing technology. Um, so these are all very serious problems and problems that people need to be aware of and deal with as for their possible discriminatory qualities very early on. I mean, there's even crazy stuff like recent studies suggesting that a lot of this sort of um, work with autonomous driving technology has the cars looking for white people but not looking for black people. Um, so, so there is so much that is so worrisome on that level that um, I, I don't write about it extensively, but it, it is, someone could. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm just curious about whether there's any, this is very interesting, and is it, does it make any difference if the kind of transportation was public or private? Because after all, like airplanes are private, subway systems are theoretically public. Yeah. I don't, I'm just wondering if that, or, or are there differences among different kinds of transportation? Or is the story, does it like at every level sort of change in the same pattern? Um. I think there are, there are some differences, but I, I do think that what all the forms of transportation I looked at at least had in common is that they are defined under law as common carriers. A common carrier is a form of transportation that has a fixed schedule that you know, it serves the public. And once you are a common carrier, you cannot refuse to serve people completely. Um, that's why all the common carriers, like in the South, even though they serve blacks on segregated terms, they could not just be like, well, we don't serve black people, period. Um, so, that, so that makes a difference. And then other than that, I think the differences have to do sometimes with um, class and accessibility. Um, there was a way, there's ways in which um, 
African Americans could sometimes escape some some you know some of the pressures of discrimination with more expensive forms of transportation, but that could also backfire because we use transportation within a system, which is to say that planes never had you know, really hard and fast segregation in the air, but when you landed, you actually had to get a cab from the airport, and cabs were segregated, wow. and the white cabs were often not there. I mean, the white cabs were there, but they, the cabs for black passengers weren't there, so you just paid hundreds of dollars to get to a southern airport really quickly, and then you're just stuck. And this kind of thing meant that nobody could fully escape it. Yes. Um, yeah, thanks for the really fascinating talk. I think this is probably just going to add another layer of gloom to your conclusion. <laughs> but I was wondering if you think that racism in transportation in the USA will prevent any successful climate-friendly policy from taking hold. In other words, you know, are mm -hmm. kind of the... Because I thought it was really striking the way you said that, of course, now it is the people who are reliant on public transport who, who don't have a car who got left behind mm -hmm. in Katrina. And mm -hmm. So it's clear that, you know, the, 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 that there is a climate element to this. And I just think, you know, is it, are we going to, are you, are, are people going to be able to winkle, you know, uh, white Americans out of their cars and onto public transportation? Or is this uh, a, a barrier? I really wonder, I mean, it, you know, within debates over the current infrastructure funding at a federal level, there seems to be a real resistance to the kind of high speed, uh, you know, light, various forms of rail that would be kind of essential to get to moving people away from their cars. And, and that resistance has many, many sources, but this sort of notion of, of the car is making you the kind of sort of you know, in control of your own domain, um, is a notion that, that it sort of goes hand in hand with many of the impulses that brought us travel segregation, which is about, um, you know, people feeling like they don't want to mix with strangers in close quarters, um, and they don't, and it also sometimes about also not necessarily wanting to, to see African Americans kind of enjoying middle class forms of transportation. So all of this is going to be is very, going to be very difficult to get over, and I think the real question will be, you know, how serious do we ever get about climate change? I mean, the United States has, you know far more massive problems on this level than Europe in the sense that even if we went towards rail, we have so much space to cover. But um, so I, I guess I'm saying I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm sure that there's going to, I'm sure that racial discrimination is not going to contribute to it in positive ways. Best possible case scenario, we get desperate enough to really move people out of cars, really insist on forms of transportation that are uh, more equitable and more climate friendly and that, you know, black and brown people benefit. That would be the best possible case scenario. If you don't have a copy of this book, now is the time to get a copy and move to the book signing. Let us thank you. Thank you.